This morning we are continuing through the book of Deuteronomy. For those who are visiting us, we're going through an expository series on the book of Deuteronomy. We are now at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. And as I highlighted in last week's sermon introduction, where we covered verses 41 through 43, that this particular portion and the reason why we're crossing over the chapter is because the nature of it, keeping in mind that, of course, the original letters were not written with the chapter and verse divisions, which we now have, uh, thankfully, that allow us to easily find certain portions. Uh, This continuing area of really verses 44 of chapter 4 through to verse 5 of chapter 5 serves as the transition in the book of Deuteronomy, not just merely between these two chapters of chapters 4 and chapters 5 themselves. Herein we serve, or we find, what is serving as the bridge between really this second portion of the book that we have covered. And that is namely from chapter 1, verse 6, all the way through to where we are here. To recap, really, this covers what we examined in the very first sermon of this series, which was not so much looking at the text itself, but really kind of zooming out and getting a bigger picture of what the book of Deuteronomy is actually doing and its place in the Pentateuch and all those various other things. And I explained therein that the first five verses serve as the introduction in chapter one, then from chapter one, verse six, all the way through to where we have just finished up in verse 43, is the historical analysis that comes on the part of Moses, explaining the history of the people, explaining where they have been, and giving this description of what God has been doing in, through, and by his people. And here now we come to this portion that serves as the transition between the historical uh, analysis, or the historical prologue as we would call it, and then the stipulations of the covenant. In that introductory lesson all the way back in week one, we explained that this whole book of Deuteronomy mirrors almost identically ancient, what are called suzerainty treaties or suzerain treaties, and I explain and I'll give you the simplified explanation once again. This particular book mirrors what we see with regards to treaties in the ancient Near Eastern world, what today we would call the Middle East where you have, in those examples, a more powerful king or kingdom coming into treaty with a smaller, comparatively weaker kingdom into what's called a vassal relationship. In other words, a kind of bargain, we might say, wherein the smaller kingdom gets protection from the greater kingdom, gets a whole host of benefits that come, especially with regards to trade, and then the smaller, ki- and then the larger kingdom, I should say, also gets additional troops for their army. They get resources and so on and so forth. There's a giving and a taking, and that is always formulated in our, as far as history tells us, with this exact same style of structure that the Book of Deuteronomy has, namely this preamble, just like we have in those first five or so verses, like you have then moving forward with what we've seen through chapters one, two and three respectively, and then most of, or the the three quarters of chapter four, where the history of the people is recounted. And of course, we've been seeing that going through as Moses has been recounting that history. And now then, what would happen is you would move into the actual bulk of the treaty itself, which would be the stipulations. So the actual covenantal or treaty canons or laws and who would get what and what the obligations of the covenant or of the treaty in this case would actually be. And this is what serves for us really from chapter 4, verse 44, all the way through to essentially chapter 26. And that's what we call in theology the Deuteronomic Code. And we'll then move into that section, of course. But herein, end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, serves as the transition point, essentially. And so that's why we're covering both the ending and the beginning. And there is some important exegetical points that we in our day can draw with regards to particularly the nature of covenant making and of covenant keeping, that is to say covenant obligation. So let's begin in verse 44 of chapter 4. Now this is the law which Moses set before the sons of Israel. These are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which Moses spoke to the sons of Israel when they came out of Egypt. This kind of phraseology, this particular axiomatic 
statement, as we would refer to it, of particularly there in the, in the second half, or sorry, in the first half of verse 45. These are the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments. Those three words, biblically speaking, are all synonymous, but we find them in this particular form quite often, not only in the book of Deuteronomy, but also more broadly, whenever the law of God is being discussed, be it in the Pentateuch or the Torah in those first five books of the Bible or as well as in the prophets themselves. These are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments. We find it also quite often in the Psalms. The Psalms very regularly use what we call Hebrew parallelisms where you will say the same thing twice just in two slightly different forms to bolster and to highlight the point being drawn. And often, when it comes to these kinds of words, laws, testimonies, statutes, judgments, precepts, etc., etc., you'll find when you go through the Psalter, those words used synonymously over and over and over again. And here, this is, again, very familiar to the original audience to whom this was written. In fact, that very phraseology, these are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments, we actually find that wording over and over and over again in historical documents from this time. And so it's setting out that these are the precepts, these are the standards, these are the laws, the judgments, the testimonies, the statutes, which in this case Moses spoke to the sons of Israel when they came out of Egypt, demonstrating the authority upon which these laws, statutes, judgments are being given. It was done so, verse 46, across the Jordan, in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the sons of Israel struck down when they came out of Egypt. We've, of course, covered that as we've gone through particularly chapters 2 and then, of course, into chapter 3. And they took possession, verse 47, of his land and of the land of Og, king of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites who were across the Jordan to the east toward the sunrise. From Ariel, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, even as far as Mount Sion, that is Hermon. With all the Aravah across the Jordan to the east, even as far as the sea of the Aravah at the foot of the slopes of Pisgah. This is laying down the History in short and condensed form. It's laying down the authority and the basis upon which this particular stipulation is going to come. And as we then move through after Advent, which is what we'll be covering by the time we return in January next year, is where we'll then actually pick up again uh, with Chapter 5 and the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. Next week we're looking at the very first portion, which is where Yahweh actually states, and you can even cast your eyes forward there if you would like to, into verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 6, the beginning, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's what we'll examine next week. And by the time we then have one more sermon on the last week of November, we'll then be into Advent. So the Decalogue will pick up in the new year itself. But here he is marking the authority upon which these stipulations are to come. These are the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments, a very familiar phrase in ancient literature, which Moses spoke to the sons of Israel, the authority figure, the one who's actually, in this case, as Moses is, representing God. He is the prophet of God to the people. He is their prophet, priest, king. And here the brief summation of this history and their place in time and history is what is serving us in our reading here at the end of verses 44 through 49. And that then establishes what is the main focus here for us this morning, certainly, which are these opening five verses here in chapter 5. And so moving through to verse 1 of chapter 5, we read, Then Moses summoned all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel. Now this is the first time that we get this phrase, what we in Hebrew would refer to as Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel. There are three examples of this, and they all come in the book of Deuteronomy. The 
central one and certainly the most famous one is in chapter 6, which is obviously we'll cover when we get to that in the new year as well, uh, which is where we find the f famous essentially motto of the covenant in Deuteronomy. And then the other one is also then repeated in chapter 9 as well. But here the first of these three instances, here are Israel. It is doing multiple things unto the audience to whom this was actually spoken. When Moses here is hearkening and again, then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, now there are, and I've explained this before, many instances in which all is used in the same kind of figurative way that we ourselves would use it. When we say, oh, I was at the shops all day today, particularly around Christmas time, we don't quite literally mean that we were there from midnight to midnight. We are using it as an expression or a figure of speech to indicate length of time in this particular case. Here, we actually find one of the scenarios where, as a general principle, all would actually mean all. Now, tens, and th tens of thousands of Israelites, of course, are not going to be able to hear Moses from the very back of the audience, so it were, gathered. But the point of what's being drawn here in the way that this is structured, especially by virtue of the fact that this is the first time in which this plenary hearkening, here O Israel, which I'll explain further in a moment, is given, this is drawing us and should be drawing us when we see these words to something of vital importance. All Israel gathered. This would not just merely be the elders of the various tribes representing the people, which of course happened all the time. It would not just be a conciliar environment, let's just say, with regards to the council of the elders. You would have all the people here. You would have families all adorned about in this central location of the encampment and of the city itself, this travelling city as they've been moving through the wilderness here now prepared on the eastern side of the Jordan. And summoning them all to himself, he says, here are Israel. Now, especially, and this will be much more of the point when we get into chapter 6, where we find the famous insipid of these particular words. So most of the exegesis I'll leave for, for that portion. But to give you the, the brief summary without spoiling the pot, here are Israel is not just merely asking them to pay attention. It is, in fact, calling them and indeed summoning them, both physically, temporally, as well as particularly spiritually. It is calling them to have this herd deep within them. It is not just merely listen to the words and let them go in one ear and out the other. Indeed, they are to hear. And the natural response on the far side, especially as you'll see here as we move through, is that hearing necessitates obeying. The call to hear is really truly the call to heed. It is not just merely to observe, it's not just merely to see from a distance, it's calling them to an active participation. Does that, does that make sense? An active participation in what is about to be revealed, what is about to be unfolded, what is about to be spelt out for them. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I am speaking today in your hearing, that phrase literally means in your, in your ear in Hebrew. In your hearing, in your presence, which you yourselves are now not just privy to but also participatory in. That you may learn them and be careful to do them. This first verse again, that whole reciprocal relationship between hearing and doing that I just highlighted as two, is found in the very words that Moses says unto them. Hear, O Israel, and then finishes by saying, being careful to do them. Hearing and doing, as far as God is concerned, are two sides of the same coin. The one who hears but does not do, truly did not hear the first time. The words came across them, but they did not actually take them to heart. They did not have them dwell richly within their mind. They did not see the value and therefore did not act upon it. Hearing and doing are considered joined intimately and intricately in the scriptures. This is why the Apostle James, in his epistle, explains that faith without works is dead. Now, of course, this particular phraseology in James chapter 2 has been a point of 
fascinating contention, especially since the days of the Reformation, with regards to the nature of works and particularly their merits or lack of merit or partial merit or particularly, or depending on who you're talking to. What we find, though, is that the words of James stand true, that indeed faith without works is dead, that faith is not just merely, as he so poignantly explains, this kind of idle mental assent. It is not just an intellectual exercise by which we give a tick of approval to a a la carte menu of selected doctrines and practices that we happen to personally prefer or favor. Instead, we find that faith is demonstrated through its action that whilst we are indeed justified by faith alone before God, apart from any meritorious works of the law, we are told repeatedly, even even and especially into the New Testament, that we are saved unto the doing of good works. That we are not just called to punch our ticket to heaven, tick our travelogue to the afterlife, and then kind of kick back and just wait for the good stuff to start beyond the veil of death. Instead, rather, that we are actually called to act, and that we are brought into a kingdom, not to be idle and slothful, but rather to now work out our allegiance unto Christ. That the king has servants, and his servants, as the name suggests, serve hearing and doing. The evidence of one's hearing is their doing. The lack of doing is the evidence of their lack of hearing, their lack of understanding, their lack of commitment. And this is, of course, not to be understood as a perfect standard. This is not to be understood as a way in which we are they're from holier in our own right or by our own might. But though stumbling and failing, though falling yearly, monthly, weekly, daily, we nevertheless rise in our repentance by the grace of God and continue to actually strive towards the calling of God upon our lives which is that as God became man, so might man might become like God. Not in the way that the ancient serpent tempted us toward, but in the way in which we are conformed into the image of Christ. God became man to reconcile man unto himself, and not in some ethereal, esoteric, Gnostic fashion, but indeed to truly bring us as his people, into full union and communion with God, truly and by nature. Hearing, true hearing, brings about and results in doing of these laws and of these statutes. He then says in verse 2, Yahweh, our God, cut a covenant with us at Horeb. This is to say Mount Sinai. The cutting of covenant, that is to say the spilling of blood, the making of sacrifice by which a covenant in the ancient world was instituted, and which of course was then brought into its final consummation and its greatest exemplar in the blood of Christ spilled upon the cross. And the sealing of his blood by which we are now sealed through the baptism of the water and the spirit, through the communing with God by his blood and bodied body herein given to us through communion. That this Christ who spilt his blood indeed sealed forever his covenant with blood far more sacred and far more powerful, far more eternal and far more weighty and worthy than the blood of mere goats or lambs. What they could not achieve, Christ has now achieved in the spilling of his blood in the finality of the covenant in which he cut for us and with us. Yet interestingly, in verse 3, Moses says, Yahweh did not cut this covenant with our fathers, but with us 
with all those of us alive here today. Now, there's been two ways in which this has generally been taken, and I don't, I don't think they're necessarily in conflict. One of which is that this is in reference to the fathers, as to say, sorry, is in reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That Yahweh did not cut this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but with us. The second is in a more direct reference to fathers. This herein, as we've explained going through before, this here, these people are the new generation, their father's generation, mostly were passed, swept away and judged in the wilderness, of course, and here now he is speaking unto this new generation, the ones who are going to actually cross the Jordan under Moses' successor, namely Joshua. The latter of those two is the more natural reading, but there really isn't much of a conflict either, either way, and here's why. It's interesting by virtue of the phraseology that Moses uses, highlighting that this covenant was not cut with our fathers, but with us. Because really, in the more direct sense, it was in fact actually their parents, and how many grandparents were left, but their parents' generation particularly, who were the actual ones who were adults at the time when in this covenant was made. Yet he is saying... He did not cut this covenant with his fathers, but with us. And so what is being said here then? In many instances, it's kind of like I reference with regards to the word all, except actually the opposite direction in this particular instance. What we're getting here is a deeper truth being revealed, that if one gets caught up in the literality of the words, they will actually miss the point that Moses is communicating. He is speaking figuratively, but not untruly. We at times tend to think, especially in certain denominational traditions, that figures of speech somehow mean that the text is not saying something true or factual. That's not what figures of speech mean. Again, the, the common example I use is when on a warm day like today, we would say, oh, it's as hot as Hades outside. Right? Well, no one here has been to Hades. No one has been to the underworld. No one has any idea how hot that is or is not. So if someone were to come along and try and interpret those words in a literalistic sense, they would actually find themselves taking the words incorrectly. But that figure of speech doesn't somehow mean that it was actually more like Arctic conditions in the middle of winter. No, it was still very much hot. The nature of figurative language is to use vivid expressions, generally speaking, to highlight a vital and important truth, theologically, philosophically, whatever it happens to be. And here Moses is doing that, because in the literal sense, when Moses was upon the mountain at Sinai, their parents were actually the ones, i.e. their fathers, were actually the ones of, of adulthood. These were all children, and many of them actually wouldn't have even been born at this point. But what he is doing is using a figure of speech to communicate actually an extremely important truth, and one that speaks also to the heart of the covenant, which we are also inheritors of. Yahweh did not cut this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all the those of us who are alive here today. What he is doing is he is impressing upon the people that they too are a part of this. That this covenant is with them and for them. That though they were but children, and indeed many, some of whom would not have even been born, they themselves are still very much party to that which had come before them that they were not merely an afterthought, but rather that God's grace, his mercy, his love, his justice, is, as the Old Testament authors often say, given unto the thousandth generation, again, another figure of speech, saying it's given forever to children and to children's children, that God is one who reconciles people in the corporate plural sense. That God's focus is not just 
only, only on the individual, but is indeed on our wider connections, our families, our clans, our tribes of yesteryear, our nations, our kingdoms. This is who God's focus is upon and whom God's focus has always been upon. When he called Abraham forth out of the ancient land of Ur of the Chaldeans, he is, of course, the focus in those middle portions, so it were, of the book of Genesis. And yet he did not himself make this journey by himself. Yet he and his clan, his people whom he was effectively lord over, whom he was the chieftain of, came with him. And furthermore, this covenant which God made with Abraham is so clearly and directly pointed to the future. That through him, that is to say through his seed, through his descendants, all the nations of earth would be blessed. This is, of course, particularly talking about one of those descendants, namely the Christ, Jesus himself. And indeed, that his descendants would be as innumerable as the sands upon the shore and as the stars in the heavens. The kings would come from his line, including the king of kings. In this way, God blessed Abraham and all his seed. He blessed Abraham and his people. And therefore, even those here today, both here now, as well as of the audience in which we're reading, are blessed by that which was promised unto Abraham. And as we've covered before, we covered back in chapter 4, that all those who are in Christ by faith are now the seed of Abraham and heirs according to all the promises that were made unto him. This is what the apostles so powerfully highlights at the end of Galatians chapter 3. That whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be male or female, whether we be slave or freeman, we are all one in Christ because all those in Christ are now the heirs of Abraham and therefore the heirs of his promise and all that was promised unto him. What he's doing in these verses, Moses, here in Deuteronomy 5, is exhorting them to rise to the destiny that God has laid out for them. That they are not merely bystanders in all that they have heard and seen come before them, of what they've learned from their fathers and their fathers' fathers about many of these figures, like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, like going back even further, Noah and his sons, like, of course, going all the way back to Adam and Eve themselves. That they're not just merely witnesses of things gone by in past times, but are now actually part of the history that God is unfolding and that they have an important part to play. He continues this extrapolation in verse 4. Yahweh spoke to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. This is where our understanding of those figurative elements that I addressed earlier come into play. Because not only did they not actually rise up atop the mountain, because that was Moses, while the rest were down at base camp, so it were, Moses himself did not in the fullest literalistic sense see God face to face. He caught, literally and figuratively, a passing glimpse as he hid in the cleft of the rock, as God's glory was made known to him. Yet here, this very same Moses, the only one who actually experienced that atop the mountain, says to them, Yahweh spoke to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. Again, keep in mind, many of the people to whom he's talking to here were not even alive at that time. Why then is Moses choosing to speak in such a fashion? Because of the way in which God, as he's already highlighted in verse 2, cuts covenant, or that is to say makes covenant. 
is that whilst, of course, he is the one who is referred to both in Old and New Testaments as the good shepherd that goes after the lost sheep, a very famous motif, of course, biblically, the one who leaves the proverbial 99 to rescue the one that's gone astray, all of which is true. That particular and beautiful image is not to be taken as the general standard manner in which God operates, especially with regards to his focus. We live in a time, particularly post-enlightenment of the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, wherein we dwell in a hyper-individualistic society very, very firmly and unashamedly fixated upon the individual, upon, of course, from that, the self. Everything we do often in regards to politics, in regards to vocation or occupation, in regards to even our family lives, ends up being done from the perspective of the individual. What is best for me? Following my heart, following my dreams. And indeed, we have become a culture that sacrifices truth and goodness and beauty in the endless, insistent pursuit of what is best for the self. The scriptures of God give the very opposite setting, the very opposite picture, the very opposite reality. We've covered this also in part, at least in passing, when we covered back in the earlier chapters where Moses orders the Israelite nation with those who are put in charge of thousands and of hundreds and of fifties and of tens. And we've explained throughout that the basic unit of society, as far as God is concerned, is not actually the individual, which has been the prevailing philosophical position of the West for the last quarter of a millennium, but rather that the basic unit of society is actually, in fact, the family. This bears out not just scripturally, but philosophically. While individuals, of course, matter, no individual has come about absent or outside of the context of the family. Broken as one family might be, absent as one or both parents may be, the reality biologically that God has instilled in this world, despite man's many efforts, still remains that we are brought forth from a mother and a father. We are brought forth in the context of family. The family is the basic unit of society and that is why the enemies of God for many decades, perhaps even centuries, have attempted to undermine, to thwart, to destroy, to corrode, to corrupt the family as the bulwark and as the very mortar upon which civilization is actually held together. The group matters, not at the expense of the individual, but also not with regards to its elevation above. God cares about families. For any of us whose history, our ancestry comes from the West in particular, our ancestors have been Christian prevailingly and progressively for over a thousand years. Again, this looks different depending on where your ancestry hails from. But for those who are of European descent, the Christian faith, by the grace of God, has been growing and expanding now for 2,000 years. It's been expanding through other parts of Africa, particularly Northern Africa. There are people in the Middle East whose families have been Christian for 1,800 years. These are things which are lost on us often. And that's not making one better. The length of how long one family has been Christian is not what actually saves you. But it testifies to the fact that God is not just merely concerned with saving a group, massive group of individuals that have no tangential connectional relationship with each other. He's concerned with saving families, with saving clans, with saving tribes, communities, nations. Again, this is the very heart of the Great Commission. 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Christ. Go, therefore, and disciple the nations. Often that gets translated as make disciples of, a better, more direct translation, especially with regards to the fact that it's an imperative, would be disciple. Disciple the nations. Because God is here to win the nations. He is here to overturn the darkness that has prevailed upon mankind for eons, for ages, for millennia. A world which once existed in darkness with this small little mustard seed, this tiny little kernel of light on a small strip of land in the ancient Near East would be the point, the epicenter by which the kingdom of light, the kingdom of order, the kingdom of truth, the kingdom of God would then explode and expand upon the world in which the gospel of the kingdom of heaven would go forth from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Because indeed, as is said by the prophet Isaiah, the coastlands await God's law. That he has come to bring light upon a world of darkness. That darkness would not prevail and that light would win the day. To reconcile all that had fallen away, to overturn the apostasy at Babel that we find, for example, in Genesis chapter 11, of the nations in rebellion breaking covenant away from Yahweh and instituting among themselves the worship of false gods. For 2,000 years, God has been completely overturning this paradigm, reconciling the nations unto himself until all those nations and all of his enemies are brought beneath his feet, the last of which is death itself, as the apostle tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he shall reign at the right hand of the Father in all universal majesty and dominion until all his enemies have been made a footstool for his feet, because his mighty scepter goes forth from Zion, and he has been given a sacred command, rule in the midst of your enemies. And so when he says here that Yahweh spoke to them face to face, he's drawing to them this reality, that God is the one who condescends to our level who humbles himself unto us. This is why the one notable difference between this very obvious treaty structure that I highlighted in the beginning, that I highlighted in the very first sermon of the series, if you want to go back and look at that too, of the book of Deuteronomy, the one notable exception is that what you would get after the stipulations, which for us herein is essentially chapter, the end of chapter 4, what we're looking at now, all the way through to chapter 26. The one noticeable difference after those stipulations is that then, in the ancient Near Eastern world, they would, of course, then make an oath, cutting a covenant, a blood oath, by the gods. Okay? That's noticeably missing from Deuteronomy. And the reason why is because Yahweh swears by himself. We depend on his oath. This is the words that we sing when we sing the hymn, The God of Abraham Praise, for example. He by himself hath sworn we on his oath depend. This is why. He swears by himself. He makes an oath upon his own name because there is no higher authority in heaven nor upon the earth than the eternal God who transcends both heaven and earth. Therefore, when he makes covenant as he's done here, when he enters into covenant with us, he condescends to our level. This is why the eternal Logos, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, became flesh, became mortal, took upon himself our estate, humanity, 
And this flesh, this body now became the tabernacle in which the divine essence, the substance of who God is in his deity, now dwelt and resided. And he humbled himself even unto death, so that in order, in order that he would then rise in light and life, imparting to us all that he achieved in doing so. Yahweh spoke to you face to face. He came down to the mountain. Moses did not simply go up atop it. He came forth to the people. He brought them out of the house of slavery in Egypt. He came down to Abraham. He came forth and spoke unto Noah. He created Adam and Eve in the midst of his temple garden. God is the initiator because philosophically God can only be the initiator. We need him to be the initiator because the scriptures so clearly proclaim unto us that we are incapable, we are unable to do what the religions of the world have so constantly and incessantly tried to do without success, which is earn favour and merit of the gods or of the divine essence of the universe or whatever particular conceptualization one culture has, in which we feign ourselves to a level of righteousness and of moral perfection and goodness that we do not actually possess, that we are actually incapable of achieving within the human condition. That it is not just merely outweighing your good with your bad, so it were, or bad with good, I should rather say. That it is not just merely having the scales hopefully tip to one side or the other. God's standard of justice is his own character and nature, which is perfection, which is completion, which is purity, which is holiness. And we in our human estate cannot achieve this. We have been demonstrating this since the dawn of our existence. Therefore, God in his graciousness stepped down to our level, condescends to our estate in order that he would then raise us back up. Not just merely from death to life, but in fact, from mortal life unto eternal life that we would become like God by virtue of his entering into union with us, not as our forefather ad, forefathers did, especially with regards to Adam, seeking to snatch by their own authority what God had told them was not theirs to have yet of the taking of what they believed themselves to be rightfully theirs. But yet this very thing which they sought, which they took illegally, which they took immorally, is what God himself draws us into. That we would be conformed into the image of this very one who came face to face. Who here, face to face, meaning figuratively, fast forward one and a half millennia, for us now 2,000 years beforehand, where face to face now meant literally. When now those, as I've covered before in this, these chapters, where now this very God, who is spirit by nature, and is spirit, has now actually come in the flesh and we have beheld his glory. And we've seen him face to face. Now again, we ourselves sitting here in the year of our Lord 2023 have not actually seen him face to face. Yet we can rightfully say that we have beheld his glory and that we have beheld him face to face because we are joined by the communion of the saints with those who have, and we read their words herein, particularly in the Gospels, and then of course throughout the rest of the New Testament canon. 
those who have seen him face to face, those who are eyewitnesses, those who did behold the face of God, whose face could now be beheld. We are joined with them by the one spirit, through the one Lord and the one faith and the one baptism. Just as these Israelites here, though not having literally seen God face to face, could rightfully say that they're being joined in covenant with him, have seen him face to face, we too, though we have not literally seen Christ face to face, can also know with confidence and hope and joy and prevailing confidence that we have beheld the glory of Christ because the Logos, the word of God, who is a person, has revealed himself in the word of God literarily. We will one day behold him in the literal sense, face to face. And so in verse 5 herein he finishes, I was standing between Yahweh and you at that time to declare to you the word of Yahweh, for you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up upon the mountain. Moses here stood as the intercessor between the people and God. He was the mouthpiece of God unto the people and the mouthpiece of the people unto God. He was their mediator. Because indeed, between mortal flesh, humanity, and the divine spirit, that is God, the essence of who he is as deity, needed a mediator. This is why Christ is the greater Moses. He is something that Moses could never be. Moses was a mortal man, esteemed, renowned, and rightfully so. Chosen for a most unique destiny, which we read of right here. Yet Christ, as the perfect mediator, did not just ethereally or in an abstract form mediate between God and man. He did not do so in a one-sided fashion as Moses herein does. Not by his own fault, but by the limitations of his own mortality. Instead, Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, mediates between God and man in his very person. We confess him to be in the creeds, fully God, fully man that he is indeed true God of true God, and yet he is the fullness of humanity in all of his essence, yet free of sin, indeed the one who was made sin on our behalf, the one and only of us who never deserved such a fate, was made so by a divine writ, that is to say by divine decree, by his own will, so that he, not only in his person, would act as the mediator between God and man, but by joining humanity, by joining his people to himself, by the power of the Spirit of God, we therefore now also would be joined with God. That to be conformed into his image is all that is entailed in who Christ is as the hypostatic one, that is to say, the one who is fully God and fully man in but one person. Here they needed Moses to stand between them and God. We now have a greater and more perfect mediator who also seals this very covenant by his own blood and by the piercing of his own flesh. that though they in their day were terrified of the divine essence, and rightfully so, we too should fear God, but also know and understand that the veil between God and man has been irrevocably torn. It has been destroyed. It has been brought down. And that now in and through and by Christ, we, humanity, are able to enter into this fire, so it were. We're able to ascend the mountain of God and ourselves commune with this very God. 
that for us this is the ultimate blessing of the newer and greater covenant which is made by Christ which is unified in his person embodied in his death, burial and resurrection and is sealed by that very blood then when we come before this sacred table to partake of the elements of the bread and of the cup we are actively participating in the death of Christ. We are actively participating in the body and the blood. That though this not be literally changed in substance, we are, by the grace of God, through his spirit, fed that body and that blood, just as we read in our New Testament reading from John chapter 6 earlier in the service. We therefore can draw from this in conclusion the greater nature of the new covenant. That we are not one that has to keep distance from God, that we are not able to actually come into his presence, but rather by Christ who came into our midst, who came into our presence, who actually condescended and humbled himself by, as the eternal and infinite God, becoming mortal, becoming a man did so in lowering himself in order that he would raise us up and bring us into the heights of his heavenly realm, that we would also commune and join with God as God is in full communion with himself. This is what it means to be in communion with Christ. It is abundantly more than a mere relationship as we tend to phrase it in modern evangelicalism. There is a deep ontological and metaphysical reality to what the Christian religion is. And it is the union of God and man. Not by our own might, not by our own strength, not by our own will, not by our own merit, but by the undeserved and unmerited grace and favour and blessing of God who cuts covenant with us, who brings us to him. This is what we are to take joy in. This is what we are to celebrate. This is what we are to acknowledge and to remember that we don't just simply look back upon events of times past. But just like those here, we are a part of this. And we also, too, have an equally important role to play in the history of God's redemptive arc as he brings the world back to him, as he brings all the nations into submission beneath his divine, loving and merciful rule. Amen.